Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm David Corey. I'm the director of Baylor in Washington, DC. And uh, our panel today is Civil Discourse in Action. And I'm with, um, I'm with a great team of panelists to discuss how we improve civil discour discourse in the United States. I'm here with uh, Michael Hill, who's the president of the Chautauqua Institute, Christy Vines, who's president of the IDEOS Institute, David Blankenhorn, who's president of Braver Angels, and Todd Breifogel, who's executive director of the executive seminars at the Aspen Institute. So these are a bunch of folks who have been working very hard in the, in the domain of uh, civil discourse. And I thought it might be wise to bring us together because unlike so many panels that focus on diagnosing the problem of civil discourse in America, we don't see as much on the solution side. And the folks I've brought together are doing actually quite different things uh, in, that, in that space. And I thought, I really thought this would be something like a workshop where we can ex share each other's experiences. Baylor in Washington is also uh, directly centered on civil discourse and trying to demonstrate it as well as theorize that space. Um, so I thought this would be very useful for people, especially in the academy, but not only in the academy, our, our citizenship in general. Uh, four panelists can be a bit to manage, so I'll be a little bit more directive than, uh, than maybe has been my style in the past, uh, but I still want to say panelists, please feel free to ask questions of each other as we're moving forward, to interrupt me, um, to put questions on the table that you think are worth asking if I'm missing good questions. And then I want to turn it over to the audience for questions. We always do this, but I'd like to maybe build in just a little bit of extra time because I've had emails from various audience members saying they're really excited about this conversation and they are coming to it with questions. Um, let me start. Let, let me start with David Blankenhorn and then Christy Vines because your organizations are are newer and they're directly and solely focused on civil discourse, whereas the other two organizations, Aspen and Chautauqua, are bigger and older. They're doing more things than that. So let me just ask David if you could start by telling us what what your organization is. Uh, and then um, just your, the, the main method you all are using to, to cultivate civil discourse. Yeah, thanks, David. Really honored to be on with these wonderful colleagues. Uh, the, our main method is to bring together people at the community level in equal numbers of what we call red and blue, lean conservative, lean liberal. So people who really disagree about politics, the future direction of the country, we bring those people together to try to talk uh, with rather than at each other or about each other. And, and we've developed a method of this that really comes uh, in large part from family therapy. There were a group of family therapists some couple of decades ago that had the idea that techniques to help families in conflict um, hear each other and try to rebuild some trust could also be used for groups in conflict. So that's what we do. We've had several thousand of these encounters around the country and uh, we, found that they, we found that they really work. And the only other thing I'll say about our method is we're not trying to change people's minds about issues. We're not trying to have them become centrist or you know, change their view about some issue. We're trying to have them change their minds about each other as fellow citizens, see the common humanity, see where there are common values, even where there are policy differences and so on. So it's rebuilding kind of civic friendship at the grassroots level through this method. That, that, that's great. I'll just add, let me, let me have you say one more word about your method because at least as I've experienced it and I've had the Braver Angels team out to campus to have, they call it a debate, but it's really not a debate. It's, it's not it's, a debate. No. It's more like a parliamentary <laughs> discussion yeah. And I just wanted to use that word parliamentary so that the audience would know that you, you, it's, you say it comes out of therapy, but it ends up looking like a fairly structured parliamentary format where there's a speaker and yeah. you have to ask for permission to speak. E exactly. We actually um, have two main kinds of activities. I was speaking more of what we call our workshops, which is kind of, this is what I mentioned about the family therapy where you're talking to one another in a certain way. The debate format, which you, which you mentioned is, um, is a, a bit different. You know, they, they both, and I'm sure that my colleagues on the panel wrestle with this too. They both come from this Socratic method, but one 
the workshop format begins with what do we have in common? The debate format begins with what are our differences? And some people like one, some people like the other, but the outcome, as you point out, David, is the same. You're trying to get people to look together to find something they have in common. That's great. I'm going to move to Christy. I'll just cl close this a quick interview with you by saying it really works. And the, the, the effort to get at the truth of a problem when you're following the methods that David is describing, that effort is the thing you have in common. Yes. So even though you differ over yeah. positions, you're yeah. engaged in a common inquiry. Yeah. And that puts you on an equal footing in a uh, way we that- should, We should make you a leader of the organization, David. That's exactly right. <laughs> and um, the other thing is you probably know, and I'm sure my colleagues see this too, when people have this experience, especially in today's world where there's so much frustration, heartbrokenness, cynicism, anger, when you have this the experience of really connecting, it really lights up the pleasure centers in the brain. It's a little addictive. You want more of it because it's it's such a positive experience. Psychology is the right is the right um, transition to move over to Christy. Christy, I think your organization, which is also new, which is also an effort to address pressing problems of civil discourse in our country, um, I've not seen I've not seen it in action, though I've seen the movie that you've put out, and it seems it seems more than David's, though it's 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 similarly drawing on on psychology. It seems to focus on empathy. Am I right about that? And could you say a word about what your organization tries to do? Sure, and you're you're absolutely right. We actually, as an institute, I kind of call us both a intellectual and practice center. Um, so we ground most of our work in this uh, burgeoning field of empathic intelligence, which largely draws on neuroscience. Um, and so much of our work is informed by the neuroscience of the brain. And so when we kind of developed and designed our dialogue uh, project and program, it really was thinking about how we can physically manifest feelings around engagement and especially issues where we disagree. Um, we've actually found, and the research has found that um, when we personally feel attacked, um, our values, our beliefs, our identity, um, it is akin, our kind of physical response is akin to being physically attacked. And so we immediately defend. And so what we really try to do through our process, and hopefully you see that in our documentary, is we really help people understand what it feels like not to have the opportunity to defend or debate, but to really deeply listen to the stories and experiences and perspectives or that are behind someone's perspective um, in order to more deeply understand where they're coming from. And from there to actually engage then in dialogue. Um, so we ground it very much in stories. We do you utilize a story exchange that Narrative 4 has made so popular and has done such an incredible job um, building and developing that model as well as many others. But it's not just hearing and telling the story, it's actually grounded in actually telling someone else's story on their behalf and how that actually changes some of the neuroscientific brain um, waves and the, the biases we hold about, um, you know, about others, especially groups of others. Just trying to get a picture in my own mind of your method. Are you saying that in order to short circuit the, the threat of the threat of disagreement um, and criticism, you actually begin by having people get to know each other and share stories and this all before anything political is ever is ever addressed? Absolutely, because we find that once people understand what's behind the perspective that someone holds, one, it immediately kind of softens that immediately that immediate defense um, response that we have, the debate kind of you know gene that we have inside of us, and it actually allows us to see one another as humans, and to often find those connection points that allow us to then engage in dialogue and what we call generative, and we base it on this space called generative dialogue, which is. And helping people understand that real true dialogue is not just an exchange of ideas, but it's coming together and offering ideas to one another so that as we leave that dialogue or that point of engagement, we actually both walk away with more knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the issue than we came into it with. And so that's really what a lot of our work is grounded on. We have a whole process that we take groups through. And I would say we're really a complement to Braver Angels and the incredible work that they do, because while I think David and, and their team really do a great job at really kind of bringing those grassroots communities together and individuals who are 
it's important for them, right? To have, be able to have those hard uh, conversations. We really work at kind of the trusted grass tops, the leaders who are kind of the brokers and arbiters of trust for their communities and really helping them understand why this work is so important. That's great. It's really important. We don't, we don't really do that, as you say, Christy. So that's really terrific. What, if I may ask, what is your prompt? I mean, how do you get to them to say a little bit about themselves and their story? Sometimes yeah. in our workshops, we'll say something like, tell us, tell us about life experiences that you've had that shapes your political outlook. That would be a question we would ask. Right. And we actually do something very similar. Usually it depends on the context. So for the film, which is uh, the documentary was Dialogue Lab America, uh, which we premiered for the National Day of Dialogue. And that was specifically a prompt about what is the story um, that, that connects to your identity as an American and oh, how you understand that. That's true. Um, and so that was really focused, whereas we did another group on poverty. And so it was help us understand how you connect to the, the understanding experience of of poverty. So it just depends on the context, but we always give a prompt. That's great. I would want to underscore the importance of something Christy said that also I, I know that happens at the Braver Angels thing, which she said, people walk away with more knowledge. David had said, we're not asking people to change their positions. And, and that's, that's right. And that's true. But you do walk away from both of these formats, knowing things that you didn't know before. And what this underscores is that the, the breakdown of civil discourse makes us more ignorant as a people because we can't learn from each other. Exactly. And, and conversely, the recovery of civil discourse makes us more intelligent as a people and therefore makes us more capable of democratic self-government. So this is just to put things in, in big perspective. I, I wanna bring in um, Michael and I am remiss in not saying at the beginning that we are co-sponsoring this event, uh, the Chautauqua Institute and Baylor in Washington. And really uh, Michael and Deborah Moore at the, um, at the Chautauqua Institute encouraged this event. So I want to make sure that I acknowledge that. I'll mention our co-sponsors at the end of the event. But Michael, tell us a bit about Chautauqua and how civil discourse fits into your mission. Yeah, David, and thank you for uh, assembling this panel. And we're really honored to be a part of it with you. And what a privilege to be with these incredible folks who are doing this work together. So thanks for, for joining as well. Uh, you know, Chautauqua was founded, as, as David intimated, um, almost 150 years ago in 1874. Um, at a time when uh, Americans were trying to figure out what to do with leisure time, right? I mean, it was this moment where all of a sudden vacations were possible, but not in vogue. <laughs> and so it actually started as a, um, a Sunday school training camp, but very quickly moved to a place of how do you use um, interdisciplinary exploration to help people be better citizens? And so Chautauqua starts its entire focus with questions. So it asks people to actually suspend what they believe and to lean into questions around critical issues uh, with the belief that, and, and I think my colleagues would agree, so much of what breaks down in civil discourse is when we enter into a space assuming we have the answers, that, that blocks off an ability to learn anything else. And so the Chautauqua approach is looking at critical issues of our times um, to say to people, there's a number of ways you could view this, come with your questions versus your answers. And so the whole format is really providing um, in-depth information from people who are uh, deep into a particular topic. And then the next thing where a participant gets to show up is not in espousing his, her, their view, but saying, what questions do you have from that? Uh, not dissimilar to some of our other colleagues, the real magic happens outside of the formal programs that happens in community, right? So there's a lived expression here at Chautauqua. We have a campus where people come during the summer. Conversely, we do year round work, both in our DC space and as well as online. Uh, but the magic comes when people can enter any kind of a, uh, a topic of friction, wanting to understand better. And so you, we try to prime them with um, latest thinking. We try to get the conversation going, starting with questions, and then hope that by asking questions, which, which begs you to not declare your own stance, right? I mean, if you have to ask a question versus declare something, um, it opens up space for people to be curious. Doesn't mean they're going to change their minds, uh, but some it does of, mean it some makes of my students, together. 
some of my students know how to ask questions that are actually answers. They're just disguised. <laughs> well, there is that too. And that's a, certainly evidence of, of an ailing society right now. Michael, I don't gotcha. have a clear, gotcha. clear picture. I don't, I don't have a clear picture in my mind of your format. Are, is it, is it, um, are they public lectures or are there seminars or is it both or how do you do it? Well, I suspect like our friends at Aspen, uh, one of the challenges of describing Chautauqua is the answer to any question you could ask like that is yes. I mean, it's, uh, we have traditional lectures, we have interfaith lectures, but we also do this inquiry through um, multiple artistic ensembles and expressions and students here. Um, there's different religious houses uh, across an interfaith gathering. There's informal and public. So, you know, we can do everything from a lecture in our amphitheater where 5,000 people are listening to one talk to a smaller space where 30 or 40 people have come together to hear something and to try to unpack it together. Um, so it's a larger in the larger space, the auditorium, how do, how do you prime people with questions? Yeah, so, so usually it's about an hour and a half lecture experience. 45 minutes is either a moderated conversation or a traditional lecture. And then it's 45 minutes of questions that come in through multiple portals. So it's mm -hmm. as old school as ushers that are walking around with literal pieces of paper, but you can also um, tweet questions. You can, uh, we have our own digital platform that you can send questions through. And so when I'm moderating those, Questions. One of the things I find so fascinating because our audiences tend to be ideologically diverse is you're watching this collision of questions coming at the same time. And <laughs> yeah. our job is to try to figure out a way to not even insert our own bias, right? Which is, gosh, person A, you said this. We've got a series of folks who don't understand the premise or help them to understand how you got there. Conversely, you'll have someone who'll say, yeah, to the gotcha question, right? They're absolutely right. And this is why the other side. And so you have to be really cautious about moderating out that noise um, to get to a critical dialogue. This is really interesting. I'm, I'm admiring the different approaches and I think we need diversity of approach. Your approach at Chautauqua is notably more Socratic in orientation than the other two, Braver right. Angels, Angels and Ideos, uh, in that you're, you're, really asking, you're really asking people to suspend their positions in order to open their mind and figure out what they don't know. Um, yeah, that's just a little different from what the others are doing. I know from the classroom how successful that can be. That, yeah. that's what I admire thing. about um, my other colleagues is I think what they're tackling actually happens in our community when we turn off the microphones. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at some point, part of my wondering is how do we engage some of what they're doing to help those community conversations that are happening outside of our lens um, mm -hmm. flourish more. It's interesting. Todd, it's nice to see you. Let's let's bring you in and maybe you could say a word about Aspen Institute. Sure. And thanks, David. Great to see you. Thanks uh, for convening us. Um, great to meet the other panelists. Um, and I'm, I should say I'm zooming in from Denver, Colorado, not Aspen, uh, but you'll be glad to know that it's zero degrees and snowy here. <laughs> um, but uh, like Michael, uh, it's hard to describe the Aspen Institute as a whole. And so I can talk about the variety of formats, but let me uh, start by saying uh, why we do what we do. We were founded in 1950 uh, in Aspen, Colorado, uh, and our approach also is really to start with questions. Um, and that's because if you don't have the right question, um, then you, you're on the wrong track altogether, right? Having the right answer to the wrong question is not especially helpful. Um, but the, the purpose of the Aspen Institute uh, was really to help all of us become more self-aware and more self-correcting, as our founder, Walter Pepke, put it and more self-fulfilling. And he meant that in an Aristotelian sense. How do we put our talents in service to something that's greater than ourselves? But if you dial back to 1950, um, there's a real crisis of values, crisis of American values, crisis of Western values. Um, how do we understand the tension between the totalitarianism and the destruction that we saw in Europe uh, in the first 50 years and the kind of liberal principles broadly uh, for which the West stood? Uh, one of our founders, uh, Walter Pepke, I mentioned, was a, a businessman from Chicago. Um, There's a strong Chicago connection. Uh, Robert Hutchins, the chancellor of the University of Chicago, uh, was one of the intellectual prime movers, along with Mortimer Adler, the great books guy. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of things from uh, Hutchins come to mind here. Uh, Hutchins, uh, Western democracy with apathy from within. And so there was a real impulse uh, to examine the core values by which we live. The other thing that, that comes to mind from Hutchins, Hutchins following Aristotle says that it's the task of each generation to assess what it's inherited 
to discard that which is no longer valuable, but to think critically and creatively about the world that we inhabit and, and are going to develop. Uh, so there's a, a real sense of understanding the past, not as celebratory navel gazing, um, but as the, the muscle of, of, of civic discourse that puts human dignity at its, at its core. Um, and so it's really with that act of faith in the humanistic tradition uh, that we convene people in various formats uh, with the expectation that through dialogue, uh, through critical and creative dialogue and civil dialogue, uh, our lives as individuals and communities will be deepened um, and, and expanded. Um, I can say a little bit more about the various formats. We, uh, in executive seminars, we can be in groups of 20 to 24, um, looking at uh, uh, classic and contemporary texts. Um, that's what brings us together. We're literally on the same page. And so the method is broadly Socratic, um, but um, it's through the close reading uh, that we discover more about ourselves uh, and each other. Um, we also have other policy convenings, uh, public programs like the Ideas Festival, uh, but at the root uh, is this sense that nothing human is alien, uh, that uh, we engage each other with curiosity and the purpose is not agreement, but mutual understanding. I, uh, I, I, thought it was, I thought it was a good idea to bring Todd Brye Fogel into the conversation because I thought he would say that he focuses on books. And that's, that's different from these other organizations that we've been talking about and to so far. And it seems to me that it has its own strength. Todd, I, I, I know you'll back me up on this, but one thing that happens when you're looking at a common book, the book is in common, and then you hear people work on the text and interpret the text. And what you see in other people when they're doing that is their virtues you see their strengths, you see, you see something about their interests and their humanity, that comes out. Uh, and and the, putting a book in front of sub, somebody, it, it gives a medium through which to engage in civil discourse. It's, it's a little bit less direct, but it, in some ways it's all the more powerful for being less direct. Does that sound right to you, Todd? It, it does. Let me build on that just a little bit. And Michael, I saw you un unmuted. But I think it, I, I think there is something that we all have in common. And that is, um, for us, the text is what the psychologists would call the third object. Right? It allows us to be together ourselves. Um, so the stories that Christy was mentioning, even the lectures that, that Michael was mentioning, um, and that engagement that you and, and David Blankenhorn were, were talking about, right? That is third text, which is to say that we already have something in common. Um, but if I can say a little bit more uh, about that, um, it's in the process of the close reading of the text that we discover three things. One, we discover a different way of looking at the world. If we're really trying to understand the author, Right? We're developing the muscle of seeing the world through someone else's eyes. Mm -hmm. That's really valuable. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, a text isn't so much a classic, isn't so much a, a who wrote it or when it was written. A classic text, in my view, is a text that reads us. So when we read a text carefully, we see a different perspective, but we also see ourselves. It's a mirror that we're holding up uh, 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 in, in front of us. But then the third moment of the text, as I call it, is a springboard for talking about contemporary uh, issues. And so we'll read everyone from Plato to Confucius to Martin Luther King and Simone de Beauvoir, Ta-Nehisi Coates. Um, and, uh, and one of the things that our participants always say is, I can't believe how relevant this old stuff is as they're talking about Plato or Aristotle or Confucius. It sounds like it was written yesterday which is true if you read it with a particular mindset. Uh, and so to be in conversation uh, with um, other people in other times and other places who've thought about what it means to be human, who've thought about what it means to live justly in a good society is to be initiated into a contemporary conversation as well, a conversation among peers, but then also a conversation with ourselves. How am I gonna show up in the world? Go ahead, Michael. Yeah. Yeah, so, I just so want to go ahead, Michael. I just want to affirm uh, what Todd is sharing because I had the luxury of attending an Aspen seminar, and and it's now some six, seven years later. The people in that week long seminar are still colleagues and friends of mine, uh, and and it came through wrestling with so many of those seminal texts and and the modern texts and and 
hats off to Aspen. Uh, Chautauqua just in the last two years started something called the Mirror Project, uh, really building off of our friends at Aspen around, you know, what do we all have uh, as a duty to understand, um, you know, after through so many of these horrific racial killings that we use text, right? We use books to say, engage that what you do or don't understand, but engage it. And together let's unpack it and let's try to understand what our responsibilities are to create a more just society from what authors can tell us. So uh, just an affirmation for my colleague and, and a thanks for seven years ago, taking me through that journey myself. Thanks, Michael. Is um, the, the division over which you are an executive, Todd, and it's the executive seminars, is that called that because you invite executives to do this or That's what is it? <laughs> It's a it's a great question. Um, it was the executive seminar that really uh, launched the Institute in 1950 for its first 20 years, really, most of what the Institute did uh, was convene these small groups uh, of, of leaders. Uh, and the theory of change, the theory of impact was, if you could, if you could identify people who are at nodal points, largely in business then, but since then, not only in business, but in nonprofit and government, um, and not just in the United States, but around the world, if you could engage people who are making decisions in this reflective moment, they would go back and make better decisions. And that it would, it's kind of a moral trickle down theory, if I could put it that way, moral or intellectual trickle down theory. Um, but, um, and, and, you know, it's not just executives, uh, because the decisions we make as human beings, not just as leaders, but as, as sentient beings, the decisions we make are ultimately moral, not technical. And yet most of our education, Baylor accepted, um, most of our education is on technical skills. Uh, and so there's a gap that we're trying to address between what we can do with our power and what we ought to do. And most of the time, our moral compass is formed by accident. And it really should be formed in a more intentional way. And so giving people an opportunity, and Michael described it beautifully, giving an opportunity, not only people an opportunity, not only individually, but in, in, in a moral community to reflect on what I believe and why I believe it is absolutely central. And I think ideally a university does that. Um, but David, as you know, one of the reasons I left the university was that it seemed to me increasingly the case that the university had abandoned that core uh, moral and intellectual vision. But very briefly, yes, we do it with executives, um, but okay. we do it with sixth, seventh and eighth graders, with high school ah. students. Um, and you will, some of the best conversations I've had on Mencius, for example, or Hobbes have been with sixth, seventh and eighth graders. And I can tell you stories that will make your, your, your hair stand on end and also your heart delight. Um, you're never too young or too uncredentialed to reflect deeply on what justice is. I know. And um, so, you know, I've, we've engaged homeless people in, in the Tenderloin in San Francisco. Um, you know, you don't, and, and sometimes the text is not something you read. It's an image. Right. Right. Um, and, and that's because it's evocative of that experience, that hunger, I think, that, that, that David uh, was talking about earlier. Right. We do get the happy juice when we learn something new in the company of another person to whom we feel connected. And that's what we do in dialogue. Can I, can I add something to what Todd, and actually really all of us have been talking about, but I think really Todd's kind of nailed it on the head is, what we're really all getting at is critical thinking, right? The, the process that uh, dialogue and, and convening and having these, um, as, as Todd said, these reflective opportunities um, through a text or through conversation or engaging with another human being stories, what that does is it really just improves our critical thinking ability. And so I love that, uh, Todd, you're starting so young because largely what I would posit is that um, much of the work that we are all doing and the reason that it is so needed right now is I would say we actually, it's not necessarily just a lack of civil dialogue. We actually have a lack of critical thinking that's happening around the big questions of our time that require exactly critical thinking to solve them. And, and I think, you know, so while we often get put into a bucket of dialogue work or, um, you know, some type of Socratic type of, you know, deep dive on, uh, 
on these historical pieces, um, really what we're doing is we're building a muscle that has long atrophied in the Western culture. <laughs> I agree. I would I would fill that out just a bit by saying the way critical thinking has ended up at our universities, it's it's narrowly conceived, and what you're doing is more powerful than that. I think, Christy, I, we, the narrow conception of critical thinking is that you look at our society and you try to pronounce things that are wrong with it. That's very different from the empathy that you're building in your storytelling things. That's not critical. That's that's sort of the opposite. It's helping us to see uncritically who who people are. Um, and, and I think that it allows for what you're doing allows for, and, and I, th I know you include this in critical thinking. I just wanted to stress it self-critical thinking, not, not aimed outwards at, at everything that's wrong, uh, with the world, but aimed inwards. How can I, how can I be a, a better, a better listener and a better understander of the, of the environment that I'm in? Right. Um, because I'm a professor on a college campus, I, um, I've seen that narrowing of critical thinking, and I think it's done some damage. I, th I think students are are given a a, a critical frame of mind that um, it it doesn't reward seeing the good in the institutions that are around us and and appreciating their fragility and and what what they serve. Would you? We've already kind of gotten into this, but I really want to ask it directly to see if we have anything else to say about scaling up. I mean. Our society is not a seminar room. Our society is not a parliamentary debate. Our society is not it, it, it is not a session in which we're getting to know each other better and then understanding uh, where we come from. It's uh, as 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 the political philosopher, philosopher Hannah Arendt said. It, it's it's not a nursery room. It's not a it's not a nursery school. It's rough and tumble, and we're never going to have everybody engaged in civil discourse. That's a pipe dream, and I'm not even sure that would be a good thing. Um, but so how do you, I mean, how do you think, I, how do you scale up your efforts um, to reach more Americans and to have more of an impact? Our model I, I take is, it that Todd's, Todd's thing about executives is a strategy. So is sixth and seventh graders and eighth graders. That's a strategy for who you get at. Go ahead, David. We, we depend on volunteers. Uh, we have a small staff, but we have over 2,100 trained volunteers. We have state coordinators in every state. Uh, we, we, you join to uh, become a member, $12. Uh, we have 78 local chapters and we're getting more each month. So, and the secret that, or what, what we want to be a part of is a social movement. We don't really even think of ourselves as an organization. We think of ourselves as a social movement in an organizational uh, container. So the whole point for us, because we're at the grassroots, the whole point for us is to um, uh, have most of the people doing the work who I, as the president of the organization, have never met. That's the goal. And, and, and because, it's, because this does meet a need that people have, um, it, it, it works pretty well. We have some important weaknesses, particularly around the area of developing critical thinking, which maybe we can get back to, but on the scaling question, uh, there are different ways to think about it. Our, our way of thinking about it is, um, think of this as, a, think of what is required as a social movement. You don't care about professionalism. You don't care about hierarchy. You don't care about branding. You don't care about any of those things. What you care about is lots of people hmm. taking the initiative, to do the work at the local level that the people who run the organization haven't met. That's what you're trying for. I'll actually add to that because again, I'm such a fan of what Braver Angels does. And I just think that they kind of have laid such an incredible foundation for the rest of us to build our work off of. But, um, and so again, being complimentary, I think to what David just said, we really, we recognized early on that, especially in this current state of polarization where there is such a lack of trust, right? Trust is broken down in every at every institutional level um, that really bringing people to the table um, has become increasingly more challenging because of that mistrust and because right. of the deepened kind of foothold yeah. where people have planted themselves ideologically. Yeah. Um, and then when you add into technology and artificial intelligence affirming, right, yeah. that they're they're right and there are all these other people that agree with them, it yeah. makes our job increasingly harder. And why we focus on those trust brokers um, 
who have the networks and the audiences and the reach that we will never have. Um, and so that's why we really, our theory of change is really to start at the grass tops level, not because it's the only way, but because right now it's, in some ways, the way we get to those communities and those audiences who would never volunteer yeah. to come to the table and yeah. have a dialogue with someone from the other side. Um, it's also why we did the film because doing the film and showing people that this is possible without one, you know, we always affirm in the beginning that empathy is not acceptance or approval. It's not coming to the table and just because you're in dialogue, it means that somehow you have to give up your belief system in order to accept somebody else's. Um, and But the film does some of that work for us. It can is a test case that people can see for what happens when I sit down with somebody who is on the complete, you know, who I would see as enemy on many of the issues that I care deeply about and, and even my own identity feel strongly about. Uh, how, do you, so how do you broadcast the film? How do people get to see it? Well, it is it is now on YouTube. So is, so you can go to YouTube. We um, we had, a, we had an incredible donor who said we just want this to get it, get out, and so we will not charge. We will not, you know. So everything is about offering this um, in the easy in the easiest access uh, possible. So we put it up on YouTube. We're going into communities and showing this, you know, in you know in churches, on college campuses, in you know with community groups who are screening it. Um, and then giving them tools to have a question, uh, an answer session, or a, a mini dialogue themselves, um, and really equipping them to do the work so that it's not just reliant upon us to always be there, because we're just, as you mentioned, we're young and we're a small organization. And so we want to kind of democratize this as much as possible. That's great. great. We, should, we should share that with our alliances, Christy. That Happy would be to. A great discussion topic for them. They're looking for good things to a lot of them have monthly discussions, so that would be a great idea. Happy to happy to do that. Yeah. David, can I build off of what Christy said? Because uh, Chautauqua views itself as a convener, so we don't view ourselves as content creators per se. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've learned, and certainly COVID has amplified, and it, it evidences what we're doing right now, is entering into this space where like-minded folks, and by that I mean looking at this group, right? We, we want to increase dialogue. Um, realize we can't do it on our own, right? And so it's how do we amplify the work of the other has become really, really important. That's how we found our way to you all at Baylor, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we have, we're geographically uh, spread out. We tend to serve somewhat different segments. And so we're trying to think of ways that we can use partnership abilities to amplify this work. Because if any of us think we own it, we've lost, right? Um, and so I'm fascinated even listening to different approaches, how we knit ourselves together in a way uh, because the reality is you need it at the grassroots and the grass tops and everything in the middle. Right. Um, and so we, one of the things we say to people that come to either the physical Chautauqua or engage in us in off campus programming is it's not enough to be uh, uplifted yourself and educated yourself. It, you've got to take it back to your communities. You have to That's do great. something with it. Um, Maybe not for this time, but one of the things that I've been struck by listening to everybody, because this has certainly shown up on our campus and our organization, is the number of people who say, stop promoting um, civil dialogue or discourse. It's time to not be civil anymore. Yep. You know, the outrage that we find. So I'm also curious how that plays out for folks. But maybe that strategy is really there. working well for us as a country. But that's absolutely right. That's absolutely <laughs> yeah, right. I believe in that. It's time to fight. It's time to get angry. That'll show them. <laughs> You know, I was going to say, Michael, heck, you know, Chautauqua is like the grandparent of all of these things. And um, in terms of history and all that, and, you know, maybe we need a kind of a convening of a number of the groups to talk about some ways to, um, you know, co work, work together a little bit. I mean, you know, because there is a lot of activity in the area. And I think uh, more convenings would be helpful. The other thing I would say, I think the, the Achilles heel of what we're trying to do now is the lack of conservative participation. It, 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 in other words, it just renders the whole thing inoperative. If we don't have um, conservatives and liberals coming together on equal terms. And what I mean is, 
lots and lots of people at every one of these gatherings who voted for Donald Trump at the last election. Now, if we convened every, we sent out a search warrant for the entire bridge building movement for one individual who voted for Donald Trump at the last election, we would have a pretty hard time. We might find a few, but it would just be like 98% the other way. So my, one of the things that we're struggling with the most mm -hmm. is, um, and I think everybody, well, I will say I'm not the only one who has had this thought. And um, so I, I think that one of the challenges we have as a movement or however you want to put it is um, taking the issue of viewpoint diversity, not just as a theoretically welcome idea, but as a practically operative idea when we have our events. And we, we have not at Braver Angels, we I think we take it more seriously than, than many, but we have all kinds of failures in this. And so I'm not saying, you know, we have the secret ingredient, but I did want to put that on the table because I think if we think about coming together as a social movement, if it's only one side talking to itself about the importance of, of bridge building, there's yeah. a, almost a comic aspect to it. So you got to, we got to stretch it out, I think. And that's a huge, uh, you know, I, I think it's the single biggest challenge we face. Can I, can David, I build on that, David, real quick? Yes, oh, sorry, please. go ahead, Chris, please. I'll just go really quick because I, I, I want to hear what, definitely what, Todd, you have to say. I, just for the film, we had the exact same experience. Our hardest recruiting was on the conservative side. And that's actually our audience. Our, we actually see our audience as largely Christian, a Christian conservative audience. Um, and we actually, again, had to use our relationships just to recruit for the film. But it was really important for us to show the diversity, the, the, the you know, uh, kind of ideological, political, and every other diversity in as much as we could in the film so that when people see it, they actually can identify and see themselves. You have to be able to see film, yourself. Yeah. Reflected fairly. Yep. Yeah. 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 Sorry, Todd. I, no, I didn't no, no. And I just, no, I think, you know, we, Aspen is nonpartisan and and I, I would say, you know, intellectually pretty centrist. Um, but I think there's a perception and a lot of self-selection uh, that leans more left. Um, but to build on David's point, um, I was talking with very distinguished uh, state Supreme Court justice who's very much on the left the other week. And he said, you know, I feel more comfortable speaking at the Federalist Society on the right than I do at the American Constitutional Society where it's just a bubble. And so I think, yes, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a struggle to get people uh, further, and I'm not even sure the category is left, right, liberal, conservative, Republican, Democrat apply aptly anymore, but uh, there's a real desire for people to get out of their bubbles and an increasing sense of two things. One, where do you go to get out of your bubble that's both safe and challenging? <laughs> And then uh, the second thing to come back to something that, that Christy said, this is a muscle and it is an atrophied muscle, the capacity to engage in civil, critical and creative discourse. And like any muscle, it needs to be exercised. And I think one of the things that all of, all of us do is, is we create containers that are not safe spaces, but brave spaces. They're spaces where you can be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that's when we learn. And to what Christy said earlier, right? That's where the bonds of trust are formed. Mutual understanding, which is not necessarily a agreement, um, but, but how do we cast that net more broadly and, um, and, and create that impulse um, to be comfortable being uncomfortable? Yeah. Yes, Todd, I, well I really put. love um, that because I, I suspect like Aspen, I mean, Chautauqua, would consider itself centrist, but gets um, branded often as very left leaning. Uh, and it frustrates me tremendously when we sit down to think through programs and, and different types of, uh, you know, what are the questions, right? And we're constantly trying to figure out as many complexions uh, that could be answers there. But I think one of the things you hit on is, is where does it feel safe to be uncomfortable, right? And for some reason, right or wrong, and just affirming what Christy said, I don't know why this notion gets branded as a leftist or a progressive thought. You know, the notion of dialogue 
And our, the, the folks that would ascribe themselves to a more conservative frame at Chautauqua will say, I'm fine feeling uncomfortable. I just like the other side to feel uncomfortable too. Yeah. One of the things I think we have to uh, really be honest about for those that would assign themselves to the left is they, uh, and I'm using broad terms here because I agree with you, Todd. I, I think we don't fit neatly into these buckets anymore. Uh, but uh, left-leaning folks will often want right-leaning folks to feel uncomfortable until the flip happens, right? Yeah. And that it's uh, so. I, and, and I think that's something we are all challenged by: is how do you how do you create a level playing field in which different modalities and different ideas can express themselves? To the greater betterment of this yeah you know we don't use the word dialogue um because dialogue has a left valence to it um, um to 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 speak in overly broad generalizations because everybody listening all hundred of and we're gonna that there's exceptions to this rule i know um but in general it's been our experience that people uh, left of center tend to have a kind of explanatory framework that comes out of uh, the social sciences, particularly psychology. And so the idea of dialogue, we can talk together, we have things in common, we can reach out across differences is much more comfortable. Um, uh, people on the right-leaning side of things tend to have explanatory frameworks that are more uh, often anchored in economics and religion. They want to, first of all, say what they think. They want to get their opinions out there and they don't want to be silenced and told that what they're saying is wrong. And so they bring a kind of a declaratory uh, model to wanting to have discussion, which can be great because they're in a, in a well-structured debate format, which we found our conservative members like much more than anything that could be called dialogue. Um, that, that, that thrives and they work and this becomes a collective search for truth. But what I'm saying is that the um, typically the language of bridge building, the methodology of bridge building, the people who pay for it, the people who run it, the people who rise to leadership positions in it, the people who come to panels like this one, and I include myself, it's all on the left. It comes out of a left framework. So, I mean, okay, too, str too strong a statement, but you get my point. Yeah. Therefore, we, I think a big thing, and I'm starting with myself, I'm looking at myself, right? I think we need to challenge that at a root and branch level um, if we're going to achieve our objective of bringing in the other half of America into our movement. Thank you for that. I let me let me share one more question with you. It's a final question. And unfortunately, I think it's a very hard one, and it might even be an unanswerable one, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And then we have some fantastic audience questions lined up that I'd like to turn to. Um, my question relates closely to what we've been saying about uh, civil discourse being a kind of an atrophied muscle. Um, I wanna describe it in older language as a virtue, or maybe it's a cluster of virtues. And I don't think that's too controversial. Um, toleration, patience, these are the sorts of things that it demands, ability to articulate one's thoughts and openness to change. But once you locate it in the domain of virtues, you realize immediately the problem. Virtues are things that we come to through practice. And one practice session does not give you the virtue. So I think in so much of what we're doing is we're giving, we're giving people a one-time experience that shows something that's possible, but how do we, how do we cultivate the virtue in our citizens, um, especially in a climate in which as soon as they leave your care, they, so to speak, they, uh, they're out there in the social media world where there's nothing encouraging the practice of this virtue. Do you understand the question? I mean, it just seems like not short-term, but really long-term cultivation is called for, but I don't know how to do that. Just briefly, I think it's a great question, David. It's very clear, and, and it comes back to the question you asked earlier about scale, um, because I think a lot of what we do are one-offs, but I think one of the things that we've tried to do at Aspen and the, and the pandemic has been uh, a gift here uh, is not only to do the, the grass tops, grassroots that, that Christy was mentioning, 
um, but to have ongoing opportunities for engagement. Uh, and so, yes, you can come for seven days to the executive seminar in Aspen, Colorado, um, but you can also zoom in uh, to things, the seminars that we're offering via Zoom that are free and open to the public. We had a young woman uh, zoom in from Kiev last Friday. Um, so, uh, so there's also an international component to this too that we might talk about, um, mm -hmm. but it is, it, is, it is a practice and you don't yeah. go to the gym once, right? You don't go to church once. Um, <laughs> you you have to you have to be engaged uh, in yeah. in in this practice. Uh, and one of the things that we found is that people leave uh, the seminar experience. And and thanks, uh, shout out to Liz Joiner in the in the Q and A for um, for for her comments. Um, but um, people leave saying I'm I'm a better listener and I'm more inclined to ask questions than I am to give answers. Uh, and I recognize that there are other smart people in the room. So there is a lot of modeling, I think, that takes, that, that, that takes place um, once, once you get comfortable with this other yeah. modality of, of, yeah. of being. Yeah. One of the things I've always liked, Michael, about Chautauqua is it is a community. Um, it's not just come to an event. It's really cool. There's, um, there's a sense of a, a kind of a relationship that's ongoing and, and also a kind of a way of thinking in general, a kind of a way of approaching things that I think you guys have done a great job of cultivating. Part of it's the historical thing, you've been around a long time, and, but part of it is also, I think, just the um, intentionality of community building. Yeah, David, thanks for that. And I think um, one of the challenges which David Corey is hitting on is, even for those who come and and drink the the big Kool Aid, right? You know, I want to make my community a better place. I want to take all that I've learned. I, you know, I recognize that I'm fortunate to have this experience that others don't. The next question is, and what do I do with that, right? And I think that's part of what we all need to engage in is when when the organizational structures that support and uplift this work aren't present. How do we re-knit that into the fabric of our society as just something we do, right? And, and mm -hmm. that citizens work on because it's expected of being a part of this society. And I think that's a good chunk of what we've lost is some of, it, some of that notion of individual responsibility to heal. And, and it goes to your, your notion of this being a virtue, David, right? And we have a responsibility to heal. We have a responsibility to understand how to live together in society in a way that advances these virtues. And, and I think that that's been lost somewhere along the way. This, uh, this, this is a nice segue into a question that I think is very important. Uh, I think it's important because just as civil discourse is a virtue, um, so is uncivil discourse a vice. It also has to be habituated, and it is habituated. It's habituated on social media, and it's hab habituated in our news media. And so the questioner asks, do you have any recommendations for keeping online communication civil, blogs, social media, et cetera? I, I, I just love the question because I could just see us entering into the, into the realm of vice, and how, how are we going to fare in there with our new virtues? I might offer um, just something kind of, I guess, short and sweet, because I think we have to remember that social media technology, it's agnostic. You know, there it, it is what we make it. And it, it took some time to get here where we are in this realm of incivility. And I will kind of put a footnote that sometime in, sometimes incivility when it comes to social change is actually critically important. Um, if right. you look at much of the research, um, the work of social change actually rarely starts with civility. Right. Um, and so, you know, if that's, that's for another conversation. But I do think that the notion, I think we're all really um, advocating for this is asking more questions than you put forth answers. Um, it's hard to argue with questions. Um, <laughs> it's hard to debate a question. Um, mm -hmm. And most people feel very respected when you ask a question. They feel challenged and become defensive when it becomes a, you know, a, an exercise in who's right and who's wrong, a very binary environment. And that's what we've created in, in largely these social media forums is mosh pits of debate. And so everybody comes in with armor up versus a much more Socratic approach, which is asking more questions to unpack what's behind people's ideas. And then, and then we can talk. 
That does evoke a kind of curiosity and a number of people have mentioned curiosity. I mean, it's, it's a throwaway story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. When I was 12 and teaching at the university, my daughter, sorry, when I was 12, my daughter was 12 and I was teaching at the university. She said, I dad, say, you're that's a, an early bloomer there. I know. Ah, <laughs> prodigious. Um, she said, dad, you're a fraud. I said, well, what do you mean? And she said, you go around asking questions that you don't know the answer to. And why do I tell that story? I mean, we live in a culture that wants answers and that somehow, and David, uh, Cora, you, you mentioned this, right? The capacity for change, somehow the capacity for change is seen as a vice, not as a mm -hmm. virtue, right? That somehow you flip-flopped. Um, so I'm, I'm with Christy. The more we can model, and, I, and I'm not sure that social media is, is where we want to put all of our our energy. I think one of the things that we found is that when you're when you have that genuine human connection and conversation with one another, whether it's on Zoom or or, or elsewhere in person, um, you you have less and less patience uh, for the thin gruel that is social media. <laughs> um, but the more comfortable we are with asking questions and not needing to have all of the answers for what, after all, are really difficult. Uh, aspects of the human predicament. The more we can lean into the questions, the more we model, I think, a different mindset for engaging each other with dignity. That's absolutely right. The conversation starts with questions. I think the big social media platforms are going to have to change, and they're struggling with ways to do that. But um, that their model is not working well, and I do think there are going to have to be some changes in it. They're aware of that. I, I know. I know teams of people um, yeah. in in DC that are that are very worried about, it and they're they're honestly looking for recommendations from people. But the they change are. has been slow. They are. Yeah, they are. One one questioner wants to know what uh, the answer is. Obviously, yes. So I think he or she just wants to hear us talk about it. But it, is ideology a problem? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, I, 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 agree I, just, with Todd. I, I agree with Todd. I agree with Todd. My world what we says mean. <laughs> that it's not a problem, and I'm sticking with it. Um, I love what Vaclav Havel said. He said he thinks we need to go from a, a, an age of ideology to an age of ideas. I just think that's great. I love mm -hmm. that. I'm going to put that on a bumper sticker. Okay. That is good. That's good. I'm, I'm, I'm leaning in that direction too, yeah. um, David. So thank you for that. We need, we need more ideas. Um, but I, but I think we're also uh, in, in a culture uh, which, which treats ideas as, as a blood sport um, and, and not as a, 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 a mode of inquiry. And so and I say no in part, David, um, uh, just to, to be silly and, and provocative. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's worth wrestling with. Um, you know, to, to what extent do we really understand the ideologies, uh, the, the intellectual roots of the things that we believe, um, as opposed to um, just uh, trying to win in whatever forum we are? Mm -hmm. Also, why I really love the work that the Templeton Foundation is doing around intellectual humility, which I think is what we're really getting to, which is this idea that, and, and so I say a little provocatively that, you know, we need to, you know, throw out ideology, but only, only to a certain extent, because, you know, it is important to come with some framework, with some idea of what you believe about the world around you. I think we would kind of, I almost think it would be impossible not to. But to have enough humility to be open to being wrong. And I think yeah. that's the tension that we really, we demonize, right? Yeah. This idea that if you come to the table with, I believe X, but I have enough humility not to want to make the decision based only on my own knowledge. And so yeah. it's important to recognize that I absolutely yeah. could be wrong. And yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually very mature, a much more mature way of looking at the big, you know, the big questions. Yeah. So is it, I mean, in some cases, it, it's the difference, right, between it's not about eliminating ideology, it's not showing up as an ideologue. Right. And, and there's a difference. Nobody wants to be an ideologue. Yeah. Well, I, I think some, some do, but again, <laughs> <laughs> provocative. No, I think, I mean, to the extent, um, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, and, and, and uh, Hannah Arendt talks about this, it's interesting that we know what zoology is, right? It's the logos of things that are alive. Um, we know what anthropology is. It's the study of the anthropos, the human being. It's interesting that ideology 
as a, a, an ology uh, has taken on a completely different form. It is not the study of ideas. Mm-hmm. It has become it has become a doctrine that tells you what to believe. I mean, in that sense, yes, I think ideology is a problem to the extent that it short circuits our moral responsibility uh, of thinking for ourselves. So yeah. I guess in my mind, maybe it, ideology is not the right word, but I I think of, you know, you know, monist thinking that that is a you have one uh, idea or one set mm-hmm. of ideas that you think explains everything. Mm-hmm. So anything you encounter fits into this structure of belief that usually revolves around a central ex- explanation for everything. And so uh, there are monist systems of thought, some of which are quite beautiful, mm-hmm. that that tell you this. And what I, my own view is that maybe one of them's true, uh, who knows, but they don't, uh, they don't, these ways of thinking don't lend themselves to um, seeing the weaknesses in your argument, to right. having a kind of more, uh, uh, to recognizing that not everything fits together into one total system that is foolproof and rock solid. So. Could we speak to this one question? A questioner says, um, it's, dialogue is nice, civil discourse is great, but can't we reach conclusions? No, not in, say, I don't think that's not, possible. <laughs> not in a democracy, because one of the things that on the big question, you could reach conclusions about what day it is. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to reach a conclusion about who won the, wins the next presidential election. But on the big questions, no, the conversation keeps going. The conversation is never closed on the big questions of democracy. Also, the beauty of diversity. Um, and I think understanding that there is a beauty in the diversity of opinion. I think, again, going back to that point of humility, um, I know I can raise my hand and say, I never want to be assured that I know absolutely the right answer on almost anything, Um, you know, because that stops me from wanting to learn. It stops the curiosity that's been mentioned over and over again. And and to me, that's part of the human experience is, you know, engaging with others and learning and exposing myself to new ideas. Um, I think the minute we reach a, a solid conclusion on almost anything is the time life gets really, really boring. Yeah, I think if you look at the, the text that, that Todd uh, wrestles with in his program, which continue to evolve, right, which is a part of this answer, those are snapshots in time that if we were to say it's settled, uh, mm-hmm. think of the injustices that would still live, right, that people were so certain of. And yet that's the human condition continues to evolve. And, and I think it goes back to that notion of questions. Every time we think we know the answer, we need to ask another question. Yeah. I mean, there are two, two distinctions I would make. One is um, particularly as we think about civic life um, and the point is especially acute at the moment. Right? We're either going to settle our differences. We're going to reach conclusions um, by persuasion or by force. So that's rather sobering, particularly uh, at, at, at the moment. Yeah. Um, but the other, the other thing I would say is that um, I, I began my remarks by, by saying that the, the purpose of the Aspen Institute is this act of faith in the humanistic tradition. And, and it's through reflection and dialogue that we become more self-aware and more self-correcting. I'll just lean into that for a second. I mean, to be to be more self-aware, right? That's the that's the knowledge of oneself, the knowledge of one surrounding the the intellectual humility that Christie was was mentioning earlier. But it's not navel gazing. It's saying I can be different, right? I'm going to correct myself in reference, right? To be more self self fulfilling in reference to something that's bigger than myself. That, that, that could be something divine. It could be uh, a social cause. It, it, it could be something else that, that, that we value. But it does require change. Um, and if we think about, David, your invocation of the, the virtues, Aristotle says that, that virtue is to do the right thing at the right time in the right way for the right reason to the right person, which is to say, we never get it right. <laughs> and yet, um, every time we try to do that, uh, we recognize something that we need to change in ourselves. Yeah. A yeah. democratic polity is one that forgoes force and recognizes the provisional nature of its conclusions 
through dialogue and persuasion. I think the challenge that we all have is how do, how do we stand by the, with the courage of our convictions on the one hand and recognize that those convictions may be provisional and in need of revision as circumstances and we change. One way we try to say that sometimes at Brave Angels, a little more, I guess, social or, or maybe a little, some of the language is a little different, is that, um, you know, we're, we're pretty much equally divided along the partisan divide. And the idea that either side is gonna decisively win is probably not true. Right. So we have to learn to live together. We eat, each side has something to offer. And just at a purely practical level, simply saying that the solution to our problems is for my side to win the next election. Mm -hmm. If that's the only way we think about it, none of us are gonna get the country we want because it's just gonna be this, this thing we have now. And so just at the purely practical level of wanting our democracy to thrive, um, we can't, it, it, it can't be this either or struggle between my side or your side because it neither, neither side's gonna win. It's just gonna be this constant, it's gonna be what we have now. And so uh, we, we, we have to maybe sometimes hold our nose, screw our courage to the sticking place, talk to people we really don't like about issues that we find extremely objectionable uh, in order to, uh, keep the democracy going. I'm going to, um, I'm going to close in a second, but I, David, I couldn't agree more. And I would just say that what, what's underlying what you're saying and, and what I also heard Todd saying is that when people engage in political discourse, they do it in, they have in their minds, whether it's, whether it's, um, they're aware of it or not, they, they have metaphors for what politics is. They have an idea of what politics is. And one of these ideas that has become, I, I, um, I can measure it, it's, it's become much more prominent lately is that politics is a form of war. Uh, you use the word blood sport, Todd, uh, and, and that's right, that, that this is a this is an endeavor in which there will be winners and losers. And this is actually a delusional way of thinking about politics in a pluralist society. There won't be final winners and losers as if we're as, as if we're in World War II and enga engaging against, you know, Hitler and his forces. Really true. We, have no place, we have no place to put our enemies. Every, every candidate who has ever run for office says, I'll fight for you. I'll fight for you. Hmm, that's an interesting way to put it. The, 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 the language of conflict and I fight other people for you. I don't know. There, so I the think substitute would be, I, I would just say, I, I hear intimations of it in what all of us are saying. Defending civil discourse, it, it itself assumes of an understanding of what politics is. Politics is something like the ongoing negotiation of truce among people who don't agree, but wish to live together. Bravo. It's well, not well, glorious. That's beautiful. It's not heroic, um, but it's what we do in a pluralist democracy and civil discourse is an instrument by which we do it. So I want to thank the four of you from the depth of my heart for such a good conversation on an important topic. I also want to um, correct my mistake by thanking the co-sponsors that we have, not only the Chicago Chautauqua Institute, which is our equal partner in this, but also the Civ Civil Discourse Project at Duke University and the University of North Carolina Program for Public Discourse. Both came alongside and helped us broadcast um, this event out to their networks. That's thank you all cool. so much. And thanks, thank you to the questioners and the audience. It was a nice audience who hung in there with us for the whole time. The questions were fabulous. If I didn't get to your question, I'm sorry. These people aren't hard to find. If you Google them and you want to give a question to them, probably they'll write back. Uh, thank you all so much for your, for your energy and your time. Thank thanks, you. Everybody. Thank you, David.